episode finds you doing very well and welcoming the spring whenever it chooses to arrive. And maybe by the time this episode airs, we will have seen some grass on the ground for many of us that are maybe not in tropical and West Coast environments. I wanted to welcome you to season two of the Resilient Campus podcast, and I am super excited for you to hear the conversation and the insights and the feedback that Dr. Terrell Strayhorn provides us when we open up this second season. Now, what's beautiful about our conversation is Dr. Strayhorn had so much to share about bridging academic and student affairs work or research and practitioner work that we had to split the episode into two parts. So this special episode, which kicks off our second season, will really feature a variety of topics. And, you know, I think the the one that's primary for Dr. Strayhorn that he talks about in this episode is his identities in his family. So he's a newly a new papa. And he really talks about his identity as grandparent and a parent and um, that his family is central to how he lives out his um, identities and experiences today. He also talks a lot about sort of bridging over this 13 years of experience in higher education, bridging between, you know, professor and administrator roles and how he sees that connected to bridging the digital divide for students and families and how he sees that as directly connected to looking at issues of college access and success for for women, for students of color, for first generation students and Really, we kind of end the episode thinking about the role of belonging as an essential ingredient in college success for underrepresented students. And he talks very briefly in this episode in part one about his book coming out about research that he's conducting an inquiry that he's conducting into the topic of belonging. And that's coming out this summer. So look forward to that. So I will get out of your way for now and let you listen to episode 12, part one of two of our conversations with Dr. Terrell Strayhorn. Enjoy. This is episode number 12 of the Resilient Campus podcast. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Terrell Strayhorn, professor and CEO of Do Good Work Educational Consulting, LLC. Dr. Terrell Strayhorn is one of the foremost authorities on college student success and issues of equity and diversity in education, especially in terms of race and belonging in college contexts. Author of 10 books, over 200 journal articles, chapters, and reports, Professor Strayhorn has secured nearly $3 million in grants to support his research over the years. He's a highly sought public speaker, and he has delivered hundreds of keynotes and public lectures at more than 500 colleges and universities, and also conferences across the globe. Most recently, he was the faculty at The Ohio State University, where he also directed a multi-million dollar research center on college access and success. He's known for using the hashtag DoGoodWork on social media. Thank you so much, Dr. Strayhorn, for being here with us today. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm yep. um, looking forward to our conversation. Excellent. I'm really excited to have you. And um, I just listened to your uh, some one of your other podcast interviews. And I love that you're on this podcast tour. It's cool to um, be a part of it. It's been great to have an opportunity to. Um, I won there so many podcasts and I didn't know that. Um, I mean, I, I knew that podcasts had proliferated, but um you know, the, the scope and the breadth of so many of them. And so some of them with a different flavor toward um, like leadership and some focus more on business, but it's been great to have an opportunity to connect with so many different audiences um, and to share the message of belonging, student success, and the things we get to talk about today. So I'm excited to join yet another and important show, the Resilient Campus one. Awesome. And so I know that the bio that you provided us was really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of all the work that you are doing and have done over the years. Can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? I mean, what do you want people to know about you that are listening in? Sure. Um, You know, that's a, that's a, that's the million dollar question. I think Um, when meeting people all the time, I, in public lectures, I, Nowadays, I've spent um, some time thinking about, you know, as a 
university professor, uh, as a higher ed scholar, as a cent former center director. I think I've been in higher education and worked at, in a different enough different uh, positions and sort of had a different perspective um, in my in my career that it brings me to these really important questions like you know what are we all trying to do what is our ultimate goal and aim and how does the work of the professor in the classroom relate with the decision making of the administrator in the boardroom and then how does it all come together to support the student who's pursuing um, their goals in life, uh, probably at the sacrifice of family and guardians and grandmas and grandpas who have really made it possible. So all that to say, I end up thinking a lot about um, and even asking students, like, why'd you come to college? Why'd you come to higher education? And this is the cool thing that I, I say a lot nowadays, and that is I've asked that question to students um, enrolled in community colleges. I ask it of students at four-year institutions. I've even asked it of some students who um, are earning their degree online or through for-profit institutions, and the answer is predominantly the same. That is, students go to higher education or turn to higher education regardless of age, whether they're straight out of high school or a single mom or single dad living in you know this um, urban center of Chicago who decides to go back to school after 20 years of being away from it. They go to get a job. That is the primary motivation on their mind. In fact, I've had students say in no uncertain terms that, you know, even if they go to higher education or go to college, get their degree, if they cannot get a job when they're done, then they feel like they've failed. No matter what their GPA was, no matter if they're able to compete for prestigious fellowships, it's what can I do in terms of getting a job and earning money in a capitalist society when I'm done? That is really the measure of success for most students. Well, I say that because... I think it reminds me that we are living in a capital society where, unfortunately, we still live at a time where people are judged by what they do. Mm -hmm. um, when you ask people the question, you know, tell me a little bit about you. Most people are patient with the details of like your name and where you were born. But what they want to ultimately get to is what do you do? How do you make a living in the society? So, um, a, a little extended preamble to my answer that what I want people to know is that I am more than what I do, mm -hmm. um, even if it's taken me time in life to remember that, um, especially when we get so caught up doing um, that we forget to be. And the answer to the question is, you know, I'm a son to two really wonderful parents who have not only taught me so much about um, life. And I'll go there, you know, because I hope we get to go there through all the questions today. But my mom and dad, not only in my opinion, did a good job teaching me important values and how to have my own internal set of commitments that will sort of steer me throughout life. But my mom and dad did a great job with the help of my grandmother, um, teaching me and preparing me for life as a young black male. Mm. Uh, because race matters, you know, identity matters. And even when I didn't know it, and I certainly wasn't writing about it, um, I, I was fortunate to be born to parents who did not allow these issues to be taboo. You know, they were the things that we talked about over dinner. They were the things that I could come home and cry to my mom and dad about how I felt a teacher treated me. Um, and they would, and my mom particularly, because my dad was the sort of breadwinner um, for the family. So he was always working. And and that was a really important role in our family. We would have no bread if it wasn't for my dad's sacrifice of going to work all the time. But uh, th my mom was the one who would hear these stories about what happens in schools and then show up the next day to talk to the teacher about what exactly happened. Well, that's important because that's in me. And it's, it shows up in my writing. I think it shows up in my social justice stance. But, you know, um, when people say, where'd you get that from? Or what made you do that? It didn't start in graduate school for me. It's taken me some time to do the personal excavation to uncover where did all this stuff come from. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember being a kid in grade school and having a mom and a dad and a grandmother who would listen and who um, would fight for us to have a fighting chance in schools that really weren't designed for us. So I think that's important. I'm a dad. Um, I have two kids. Um, this is the coolest thing. If you follow me on Facebook, you know this too, that I am now a pawpaw because my daughter's had a child and, uh, 
most people, when they see me, I still enjoy the fact that I get carded at restaurants. <laughs> and, you know, um, I was giving a talk last week in New York and the woman who uh, picked me up from the hotel to take me to the event, um, she worked for a car service company and she said, um, do you go to school here? And she's trying to help me keep up with my homework. And I said, no, 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 I'm not a college student. I am the speaker of the day, but not only am I not a college student, I'm a papa. Um, and you know, when I first started thinking about it, like, Oh gosh, I'm about to be a granddad. I was not excited. Um, and my mom, who's always been a good teacher for me, um, she, she was patient. She said, listen, I know you're concerned about this and you don't want to get too old too soon. But the moment you see your grandbaby, you're going to forget all about that. And she's so right. The moment I saw her name is Kinsley Marie. The moment I held her in my arms and I saw those eyeballs, I was like, oh, I'm a papa. I'm a granddad. I'm, I'm whatever Kinsley wants to call me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited. And then last and finally, I um, something that I intentionally use and say is it's taken me, um, especially in the past, I'd say year or two, a lot of internal work and reflection to think about the appropriate title or identity for what I do in my day job, mm. you know, and um, there was a point in time I thought I, I, people would say, you're an instructor, you're a teacher in, in higher education. I was like, yes, <laughs> um, until I had to think about like what happens when the instructor doesn't have a formal classroom. Mm. Um, do they stop instructing? And the answer for me was no. Um, then people say, you're a public speaker. And I'm not offended by that title. And I do a lot of public speaking. I do speak a lot to the public. And I actually hopefully can find a way to you know, share some of this too. I spend a lot of time trying to know the public, mm -hmm. stay in touch with the public, um, because I appreciate the fact that right now on this podcast are two really privileged individuals who have benefited from education in its highest form, mm -hmm. um, so much so that you have your own podcast and I have my own consulting company. And that separates us from, you know, the average person. And but because I think the work that we're doing is so important to the average citizen, the average immigrant, the average first generation student, whatever these averages are, I think it's really important for us to, to know them. Um, Parker Palmer writes in his book, Courage to Teach, that if you, if you cannot see them clearly, you cannot teach them well. Mm. And for me, the, the higher up I go, whatever that means, but I mean, I certainly for me, it's, I, as I think about climbing the um, ranks as a professor from assistant to associate to full from, you know, leaving graduate school to being a professor to running my first center and starting my own center and then leading a center at my former institution, the Ohio state university, that, that movement up that ladder um, is celebrated and it's praised in the academy, but to everyday society, it only tears us further and further apart from them. So I think it's really important to spend time remembering um, that the average person who benefits from your podcast and my work, from your research and my scholarship, from your thoughts and my ideas, um, you know, doesn't have a doctoral degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't even know what a provost is. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people say you're a public speaker, I'm not offended by that term. I've had folks call me a public intellectual and I've certainly been called worse. So I think, you know, I thought about that. Am I a public intellectual? Um, and but one thing I have clarified for myself is, you know, people might use whatever to describe me, public intellectual, uh, public speaker, uh, instructor, professor, administrator. But the one thing I know I am is a professor in the sense that across all of these spaces. What I am doing is professing. Mm. Um, in the classroom, I'm professing sometimes the fundamentals of statistics <laughs> so that other people can learn it and use it to answer important questions in their own work. There are times where I've been in the classroom and I've been professing, um, teaching, admitting that um, race and racism matter and that they're permanent fixtures in the society. 
I've done that through my critical race theory seminar. So once I got clear that, you know, one of my gifts and callings that I recognize is the ability to communicate and that, um, you know, I thought it was my ability to sing, you know, maybe I was gifted to do that. I've played the piano too. So I was like, maybe I'm gifted to do that. But actually what I think I'm gifted to do is to communicate and to communicate a, across a lot of different media to a lot of different audiences and to do it in a way that can, um, persuade and convince and emote. And, but I, I, some, I use that in the classroom, certainly, but I use it on the stage as a public speaker. And so one identity that I've had since I started back in 2005 as a new assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, but I hold on to today and will, um, and, and will end life with is the identity of professor. Mm. I think it's a really, and it's more than a, it's not a title. It's not a position to me. It's not a job. It is a vocation. It is what I know I was called to do. I was born to do. And so I strive to do it well. Mm, wonderful. Thanks for sharing all that. And, you know, I'm really excited about this new era in your life as a papa and <laughs> really welcoming Kinsley Marie to the world. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. We're glad you're yeah. here. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes. And, can you tell us about some of the projects or some of the initiatives? How are you focusing your energy when we're thinking about equity and inclusion today and we think about access and success? I know that we we use those words often and they are huge categories. And so I'm wondering, like, how are you, what's at top of mind for you today? And looking forward, will that change? Will it, do you think it'll remain pretty similar in terms of the issues and challenges and some of the models of practice today that we want to focus our attention on and those kind of moving us into the next few years? Yeah, that's really an uh, important question, a big question. What I've really seen myself doing, more, and certainly it's top of mind now, is trying to help. Well, they're sort of twofold. One is I've learned, you know, so I'm what, this is 20. 18, I started my career the way I think about my faculty career in 2005. So I'm 13 years in, actually come August, I'll be at my 13th year as a professor, you know, working in this field. And what I've, what I've seen over the past decade plus is that I'm surprised that we aren't further along mm. than we are, you know, and that's not to start on the, you know, sad part of my conversation or to start with the criticism. I certainly think there are reasons to celebrate enormous progress in higher education. We have, what, 21 plus million college students in the United States, and they are um, enrolled or educated at more than 4,300 colleges and universities. I was at an international conference in Denmark many years ago now when I was on the faculty at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. It was an international conference, and and I said some numbers like this because I was trying to describe the the system of higher education in the U.S. And I remember looking out in the audience. Remember, this was an international conference, people from all over the globe. And I remember looking out in the audience and people's mouths just dropping open, and people saying things like, "Were you? Did you really mean that when you said 21 million? Are you sure about that number?" Mm -hmm. And it helped me just it helped sensitize me to the fact that I, I personally believe that that we are a great country. And that's my last little political comment. But, you know, I think that we are great now. We certainly have room for improvement. All good things do. But by the same token, I don't think anyone should be confused that we have an impressive system of higher education, one that is unparalleled, unmatched by any other country in the world. No one else has the capacity that we have to educate so many learners. Now, the quality is another conversation, how we do it, how we make sure people are successful. That's the other part of it. But certainly in just sheer ability to um, accommodate learners, we have an impressive system. And, and that's worth celebrating. And that system is diverse. We have lots of different kinds of institutions. We have lots of different kinds of students. We have more ethnic minorities than ever before. I love saying and will say in a couple of, well, it's a matter of a week when I start my Black History Month talks across the country. I use that as a time to remind institutions, faculty, staff, and students at the institutions that February, I mean, we should do it every day, but February is a good time to stop and remember 
that there was a point in time in our history where it was illegal to educate African-Americans. And when I was in the classroom, I would tell my students that, you know, there was a point in time where not only could I not be their professor, I couldn't even be their classmate. Mm -hmm. So look how far we've come. That's to be celebrated. It has certainly taken time and it's certainly not been easy, but that is the kind of progress and change that's possible when we are at our best as a society and as a country. By the same token, we still have serious problems in this country. That is that, you know, our graduation rate or degree attainment rate is only about 50 percent. Um, and those numbers are even lower when you start looking at specific ethnic minority groups and other identities like first generation, low income or students that help me understand there's a no income category, a student who has nothing coming in and still in college, foster youth, people with criminal histories. We have enormous diversity, but that's the access piece, which mm -hmm. you were talking about to me. I think we need to continue to open up access because while I don't, I have not really bumped into um, institutions, which would be difficult to do anywhere, but if I'm going to personify institutions there, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I have not worked with institutions who say things like, absolutely not. We don't want any women and we don't want any people of color. Mm -hmm. Most institutions know that they must broaden participation and access for women and for students of color, for first generation for low income, and then now the intersections of those identities. But I have literally been in boardrooms with um, enrollment managers and admissions folks, and even sometimes presidents and provosts who talk to me behind closed doors about their discomfort with the idea of opening up access to their institution to, you know, veterans, to too many students who are living with disability, mm. to foster youth who they don't have a history of educating or working with, and they don't know even what supports be necessary for them to be successful. And then increasingly, those who have criminal histories, prior contact with the criminal justice system, um, or restored citizens. So for, to, to me, that just simply underscores to, to all of us, hey, don't forget, access is still important. There are still many lessons there. There are, there are bridges that still need to be built. There are interventions that still need to be imagined that will open up access and create opportunity for um, individuals who are parts of the groups I just talked about. But where we also have enormous um, loss and slippage is in terms of success. We, you know, we can open up the door to higher education for folks, but we just cannot ensure and build pathways for them to complete their degrees. And this is where I spend probably most of my time thinking a lot about that question. One, to convince people, because there's, there, are, there are competing beliefs out there um, about that problem. There are people who believe, well, I mean, we admitted them. It's not our job to graduate them. You know, we let them in. It's not our job to make sure that they graduate. It's on them. They have to work hard. They have to study hard. They have to be college ready. They have to seek help, you know, use the resources. We provide the writing center. It's not our job to get them to go. And I don't believe that. I think that it's actually far more nuanced and complicated than that. And so I have realized that there are still a lot of people who sit in really important seats who need to be convinced that part of our job as the professionals in higher education is to not only ensure and open up access, but to create opportunities for success, to provide supports for success, to match our enrollment management strategy around admissions and access with strategies for making sure they graduate and really helping build this collective mindset that we have a role to play. It is part of our professional responsibility, dare I say social responsibility. I think it is irresponsible when we admit students who we don't think will graduate or when we admit students and don't even look back to see if they graduated. I think that that is something that I've, I've taken a lot of time to do. Um, and then there's also the idea of, of, you know, in the social justice equity diversity space of really talking to audiences about that, you know, and I've spent more time, I say in the past six or seven months doing this because I've had a lot of epiphanies and thoughts about it, um, born of my own research and so forth. And that is this, we know for a fact, we've known for a long time that education creates opportunity for upward social mobility. I was in um, Tennessee 
in Knoxville, Tennessee. Actually, I was like sort of northeast of Knoxville, Tennessee. On some day where, you know, it was warm out, my lips were dry, I needed chapstick, I probably should have gone to, I don't know, a really expensive store to get chapsticks. I know, you know, that's what you're supposed to do is, is like spend a lot of money, but I didn't want to spend a lot of money. I just wanted some cheap chapstick. So I stopped to Walmart, you know, don't judge me. Safe space, right? Um, so I stopped to Walmart. I get so much pushback from from, to be quite frank, educated folks who say, oh my gosh, you went to Walmart. And it's not like I agree with the politics of Walmart or the pay, pay you know, um, schedule for Walmart. It's just, I wanted chapstick. I needed it. I was driving. I stopped to Walmart. All right. So I stopped to Walmart to get some chapstick. Long story short, I'm in the line to pay for my, I don't know, dollars chapstick. And I had on sweatpants and these um, super shoes, supras, they're sneakers kind of made famous by Justin Bieber and I had purple pair on. So I have them on, I'm dressed down. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to a stage. So I have on like just regular old clothes in this Walmart and this young man, young, I guess he's probably like seven, eight white male looked at my shoes and he proclaimed in like the loudest voice ever. He's like, those are supras, but he has this heavy, heavy accent that reflects the sort of area in which we were located at that time, sort of country drawl. And he said, you know, those are supers. And his dad said, be quiet, you know, leave the man alone. And he's looking at my shoes. He just cannot understand where these shoes came from. I, I, you know, so he, he keeps looking at them and pointing at them. And so I nod in agreement. Yes, these are supers. I said, do you, do you like supers? He said, well, Justin Bieber has them. And I said, yeah. And he said, so how did you get them? And I guess he was trying to, you know, cognitive dissonance. How does Justin Bieber have Supras. And here it is, this young, fun size black dude with curly hair <laughs> in Walmart had Supras. I don't know if you thought I stole them from Justin or what was going on, but <laughs> I could I could tell from the curiosity in his eyes. And I, I say that because I think one thing that educators all ac- across all spectrum of education should remember is that underneath it all, the race, the age, the sexuality, the political affiliation, the social class, underneath all those identities of our students is a person who's curious about learning, about understanding how the world works. And so despite everything that made this young man so different from me, I saw that sparkle in his eye that he really did not understand what was going on. And so I sort of was was awakened to the generational gap, the social class gap, all of this, the privilege that I had in Walmart that this young man was shocked. How in the world did you get Justin Bieber's shoes on your feet? So I told him, I said, um, you know, these are not Justin's shoes. These are mine. I bought them. Yeah, you bought them from where? I said, I bought them off the internet. He said, I know, but how did you get them? I said, well, they were, they were sent to me. No, how did you get them in your hand? And then I realized we talk a lot about the digital divide. Well, that's what the digital divide looks like in Walmart on a regular Saturday. It's mm-hmm. a taken for granted understanding of e-commerce that this young man knows nothing about. So all I remember, long story short, was I didn't care about the cleanliness of the Walmart, but I knew here was an opportunity to inspire, to educate, to connect this young man to um, a world that he would have to know something about for him to be successful in the future, the future that we've created for him, where most jobs will require some understanding of technology and e-commerce. And um, so here it is in Walmart, the professor, remember, who's dressed in these down, these dress down clothes, gets on my knees. I scoot over to him, pull my cell phone out. I said, I bought him online. This is the internet. Well, this is not the internet, but this is my cell phone. It allows me to connect to the internet. And I went to super.com and, and he drops his mouth. Oh my gosh, look at all those shoes. I said, yeah. I said, so you can get them from here. He said, but how do you pay for them? I said, a credit card. Oh, credit card. So I pull out my wallet. This is a credit card. Now, I know this is a podcast and it lives on even beyond today. So just forgive me for how I simplify for the seven-year-old the whole idea of a credit card. But I basically said, like, the bank has my money. And in exchange for having my money, they give me this card. I can use this card in the place of money. So if I spend $5 on the card, they just take 5 dollars out of the money I've already given them. It's sort of like a loan kind of thing. He said, oh yeah, I get it. I said, okay. So I found the shoes. And so I don't know here, do you see a pair of shoes you like? And, uh, and he goes through and he takes his time. I mean, 
three or four people skip me in line while I'm sitting here having this lesson with this young man in Walmart. Finally, he sees a pair that he likes. He says, oh my gosh, I love these. And he looks up at his dad and his dad is now looking down at the lesson as well. And so what I did was I said, um, yeah, so click the button, add to cart. He said, oh no, where'd they go? <laughs> Look up, they're in your cart right there. So yeah, so now you click place order. And he's like, what is that? I said, it's a form, you had to fill it out. In fact, go ahead, what's your name? So he gave me his name, put it into me, the phone. And because I had purchased Supras, I knew how to do this. So I showed him the card. I said, put those numbers in there. Asked him for his address. He consulted with his dad and got it. I said, and so if you were going to buy these shoes, what you do is you press place order. And then something told me, do it. So I told him to place the order. Mm -hmm. And he did. So I told him, I said, there it is. You just ordered your first pair of Supras. Mm -hmm. And I can tell the story up to that point every time, but I get sort of choked up because I've never seen the young man. I don't know where he is. Mm -hmm. But I do know that this young man who is very different from me has a pair of Supras that a black guy with crazy hair bought him in a random Walmart as he sort of taught him about the internet. And for me, it sort of just reflects what I think all of this stuff is about anyway. You know, it's what the podcast I hope is about. It's what the books are about. It's what the teaching is about. It's what the public speaking is about. It's so that ultimately we can make the world better. I mean, my life was enriched, though I, I don't get the pleasure of seeing him wear those shoes. Just the fact that I know that they got to receive the box and think about, like, why did he do this? And, and the fact that I was enriched by being able to traverse that digital divide in Walmart and to turn Walmart from a super center or supermarket into a classroom just for a moment, mm -hmm. was sort of magical and meaningful for me. That's the kind of work that I see myself involved in. Not always in Walmart, clearly. Most times with campuses and institutions, but really trying to make the stuff real. I think we've got so much language in higher education. We talk about intersectionality. We talk about digital divide. We talk about college and career ready. But quite frankly, I'm worried, deeply worried, actually, if I can be quite honest, that we don't have a clue you know, what it all means and how to really use the theory and the language to create opportunities for young people like that young man in Walmart. Because I realized that day, his accent, without the guidance of teachers who will help him manage it to people who will be far less patient than you and I, will cut off job opportunities for him in the future. Mm -hmm. Unless we fight now, to make sure that regardless of wherever I was in Tennessee that day, that his school gets access to technology and qualified teachers, teachers teaching in their field in every single classroom, and that we can equip his parents with the resources that they need to cultivate his curiosity and to expose him to a world that he knows nothing about. He will have limited opportunities. That's the, and that's unfair because you know what creates that, that disparity is the fact that he was simply born where he was born. That's how random it mm. is in the society. I tell my mom and dad all the time, like, or I tell people all the time, like, I'm, I can say to you, I'm on your podcast today, partly because I chose the right parent to be born to. But the reality is this, no kid chooses their parents. You're born into these circumstances. I just happen to be born to parents who were able to move out of their apartment eventually and find a home. And they settled down in a good neighborhood where I was tracked to go to good schools where most, not my parents, but most other parents had the political capital and the cultural capital to demand qualified teachers. So I benefited because I was in that environment. I've always had, you know, when I went to high school, I remember in my 12th grade year, most of my teachers had doctoral degrees. They were Dr. Shin and Dr. Tricondo. I thought this was true of all students. It wasn't until I became a grad student that I realized, oh my gosh, Look at the privilege I enjoyed and because of the arbitrary decision of where my parents decided to build their home or buy their home. That's unfair. That is unfair that in a democratic society, some kids don't get access to the kinds of schools that equip them for college and therefore don't go to college, which equips them for that kind of good job to make good pay so they can have a good life. And so I've spent more time, I'd say in the past two years, just trying to help people remember in these privileged seats in higher education that everybody's not privileged. And it's not actually because you're so smart. Yes, we're smart. And it's not actually because you stayed up in graduate school and studied really hard that you're now enjoying a six-digit salary. I'm sure that paid off to some extent. But it's also because of this lifetime 
of privileges that you've benefited from. And now we have a social responsibility to look back, reach back, and to help other students succeed. That's 50% of my job is trying to change the mindsets of people in higher education to be open to inclusive excellence, equity, and diversity. And then the second part of my job is to really say, now that we're there, what can we do to make sure that first-generation students graduate at the same rate as those who are continuing generations, or that foster youth don't come into higher education and leave after their first year, either because they didn't have the support they needed to be successful, or they bumped into so many cultural clashes, words, and ways of thinking and ways of doing stuff that are so different from what they were raised on that they get frustrated and leave. So that's the other part. And belonging really wasn't by design. I thought belonging was just an article turned book and I would move on, but it really has become sort of that life work for me because I think belonging is, has enormous potential for helping us connect access, which is about giving them, you know, understanding that they need to belong and Mm -hmm. bringing them into the community where they belong. That's the access part of belonging. But making sure that they ultimately feel that sense of belonging is a success piece. And it has a lifetime of positive consequences. So I'm just, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. I'm still thinking about it. I don't foresee, probably not in the next five or seven years, my work changing in dramatic ways. I certainly, I just finished the second edition of the Belonging book that comes out this summer, this summer. And what I'm trying to do now is think about belonging beyond just college, belonging in a broader sense. And what would that text or book look like? And that's going to take me some time to chart out, conduct the research to get the insight to write the book. Thanks so much for tuning in. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on a single episode.